All right, Coach, thanks for joining me today on uh, this Simple Coach to Coach interview. Do appreciate you taking the time. Um, I uh, kind of found your way through talking to Coach Finley at Susquehanna, and um, he holds you up as one of his successes in the coaching ranks and developing the coaching tree. So uh, glad we were able to connect today. Uh, appreciate you having me. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. All right, so you've been at uh, Lycoming since 2013, and you know I was looking at since then. I mean, you've had a you, you've had a lot of success there. Um, but let me ask you what what's what's been your soccer slash coaching journey been like, and and how did you end up at Lycoming? Yeah, um, to be honest, it's kind of funny that uh, I, I ended up in soccer. Uh, grew up in a big uh, athletic family. Uh, my dad is, well, he's retired now, was a college football and baseball coach uh, at, at Juniata College. Uh, my mom uh, coached uh, volleyball at, at the high school and uh, collegiate level for uh, a number of years. Uh, my brother uh, is currently the defensive coordinator out at Carnegie Mellon University on their football staff. Uh, and to be honest, we all probably thought that my sister would have been uh, involved in the coaching as well. Um, she's uh, decided to go a little bit of a different route. Um, she's uh, working in a development office. Uh, she was at Penn, then made her way to West Virginia and is now back uh, home where we grew up at, at Juniata College. So mm -hmm. big athletic family, kind of coaching in the blood a little bit. Um, and so growing up, uh, you know, football, basketball, baseball were kind of the main sports uh, in, in the family. And somehow naturally, I just, uh, you know, soccer grew on me as, as it went on and uh, was very lucky to end up at Susquehanna playing for uh, Coach Finley, as you mentioned before. Uh, kind of my love uh, for the game kind of really took off from there. Um, I um, actually went there hoping to play both soccer and basketball, both, uh, tried to do both my first year. Uh, it was just, just way too much. <laughs> yeah. uh, at that point, I probably liked basketball more, uh, but was probably a better soccer player. And so it was, uh, kind of start on the soccer team or, uh, play on the G basketball. Team. And so, mm -hmm. uh, Stuck with the soccer, and it's been a great decision. So I had a great four years for Finley, uh, learned a ton. Uh, I never really played high-level club soccer uh, because I did three sports and really loved all three and was passionate about all three growing up in, uh, uh, in high school. Um, and so I really learned a lot from Finley. It was my first real high-level um, you know, soccer experience uh, from there, moved on to, to Westminster College, uh, worked for Girish Jakar. He was fantastic as well. Um, he's one of the very few coaches still that coaches both the men and women uh, mm -hmm. at Westminster College. And over his time has now over 500 wins. So he's had a, a tremendous journey there. Uh, maybe I went up to Vassar three years as the assistant, worked for Andy Jennings, who just retired. Um, he was yeah. uh, awesome. Uh, and then uh, wanted to dip my toe in Division One waters. Um, did three years at Lafayette. Had a great experience there. Really liked the Patriot League, uh, but just wanted to get back to a school that kind of I knew growing up that was similar to Juniata that I went to in Susquehanna. The Lycoming job came open, and mm -hmm. uh, you know it's really it's really worked out great. It's been a, a really good fit for me here. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the journey. Uh, going on year 10 now here, which is uh, just crazy. But uh, everything about Lycoming uh, and, and Williamsport has been a really good fit for, for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So if you're college football ranks in Carnegie Mellon, you're familiar with uh, University of Mount Union? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I think we played you a few times or beaten you a few times, I would say, as, <laughs> yeah. a, as a Mount Union grad. Yeah. Um, oh, you were to, went to Mount Union? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Great. Back, back in the 80s, before I graduated, and then once I graduated in 90, and then 93, they won the first national championship of what, like 13 so far? And um, that was their real, that's when they really started to rise 
and become who they are today. Yeah. So. so Mount Union beat Lycoming uh, in the yeah. national championship. Uh, That's yeah. Twice in the nineties. Uh, yeah. One in Salem, Virginia. I'm not quite sure where that was, but uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um. So, so we uh, talking about Coach Finley. I'm just curious, what was it like playing for him, and what was that experience like? Uh, yeah. Your four years there. Yeah, no, it was uh, it, it was great. So I wasn't because I never really did high level club soccer. Um, I wasn't the the top recruit on anyone's radar. Uh, um, got offered roster spots at a couple of different schools, um, but by no means was I expected to come in and. Uh, um, you know, being an immediate contributor or, or, or mm-hmm. things like that. So uh, went in just expecting to work hard. And, uh, again, soccer wasn't big for me uh, at that point. I hadn't played level, and so I had a lot to learn. And mm-hmm. uh, Coach Finley was great, you know, getting me up to speed with things that I needed to do. I came in. I mean, I was always a worker, really fit, uh, good defender, those types of things. But – uh, from the technical and tactical side, I had a lot to learn, um, and he did a good job getting me on board. I, you know, by dumb luck, I, I, you know, would have been a reserve, um, you know, to start the season, but get going into the, you know, right into the season. One of the starting defenders got injured, uh, senior, uh, which got me into the lineup, and by the time that he was ready to come back from his injury, uh, the other outside back went down, uh, and so I just shifted to uh-huh. And um, fortunately, after that, I'd kind of, you know, earned my way, earned my keep in, in, in the line, and it kind of went from there. But um, so I got some some luck there due to some some uh, teammates' injury. But uh, as I said, from the coaching standpoint, um, you know, Finley kind of took me under his wing and really, you know, recognized something in me that probably not a lot of other coaches saw. And, uh, you know, was able to utilize, you know, some of my strengths in terms of my competitiveness, my aggressiveness, uh, athleticism, some of those types of things to, to get me on the field and, and be a valued member. Mm-hmm. I, I will say I, I'm a big fan of the multi-sport athletes, and it's a shame that it doesn't – it's not as common as it, it used to be, right? Where, yeah, like with your experience not playing club soccer, well, that was – kind of normal more it was more normal than not um uh just because right like so many guys were they went soccer or whatever to basketball and then were were baseball or track like and that was the experience that a lot my guys i played with they never played club soccer because of that and they were hyper athletes like just you know could play anything you know so yeah yeah I, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was me. And uh, it is crazy now that uh, the pressure on uh, on these guys to play year round and at the highest club possible mm. and now even where, um, you know, some colleges don't even want these guys playing high school soccer because yeah. that's not enough that they have to play, yeah. uh, you know, in the academy or the MLS yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. And uh, So, I mean, I, I understand both sides there. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand coaches want guys playing soccer at the high level for as long as possible to get them prepared. But I certainly think there's something to be said for, you know, allowing guys to play high school uh, where, um, yeah, they are the better players, but they get to work on other things, their leadership mm-hmm. skill, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. They get to play with their buddies and, mm-hmm. and different things like that. So, yeah. I'm, you know, a, a, a big proponent of, uh, you know, track and field and, yeah. and some of those, you know, I think track, cross country, those types of things in high school are, are really great for, for soccer players. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to get my sons to do track and they totally ignored me, but, um, <laughs> and, and part of it was because, well, they couldn't because they had club soccer, right? Like it's just, right. there's right. only so many hours in a day and, Fortunately, they're all strong academically, so it's like they need time to work, do work, and so that that sort of went by the wayside. Hey, let let me ask you. And and I mean, you've been doing this for a while. I mean, from from when the point where you started coaching, whether as as an assistant, and, and then 
through time. Is, do you see a difference between the players that get recruited now versus then? Like, do you see whether they're better, smarter tactically, any of those any of those things or others? Yeah, so uh, for me, I mean, I've been at a, a couple different types of schools, and so the recruitment process has been – uh, a, a little bit different. Um, I, I, you know, I mentioned I'm very familiar with Juniata, went to Susquehanna, mm-hmm. I like homing when I was at Westminster. Um, you know, those recruiting processes were pretty, pretty similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vassar was a little bit different, uh, recruiting, um, a lot more West coast, mm-hmm. uh, those guys when I was there, uh, obviously New York was our number one, uh, in terms of uh, geography, in terms of students enrolling in the college, mm-hmm. uh, Cal- California at that time was was our second largest state, mm-hmm. and so I don't know if that's still the case at Vassar since I've been gone. So we spent a lot of time um, in the recruiting process uh, out on the West Coast mm-hmm. uh, when I was at Vassar, and then when I was at Lafayette, uh, obviously we were we were for the country. Mm-hmm. We were down in Florida, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were on the West Coast, and so. Um, the process has been a little bit, um, you know, different depending on uh, the schools that I'm at. And, and here at Lycoming, uh, while we're certainly looking for students, uh, student athletes, you know, the best from anywhere in the country. And we have had our share of international students. Mm-hmm. Uh, a large percentage of our guys are um, PA, Maryland, uh, Jersey, Virginia, New York, mm-hmm. uh, more within a, a, a three to four hour radius mm-hmm. that, uh, that we're recruiting now. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at Vassar, was that California? Is that just because of the nature of it, or is there the academic part that was made it a little bit different? Yeah, so the academic piece certainly. Um, Vassar is a very prestigious, prestigious school yeah. uh, academically, uh, and then also is a, a very liberal school. Yeah. Uh, and so students uh, that were kind of looking for a more liberal school, you tend to find a lot yeah. more of those yeah. uh, in California than you do in some other uh, parts of the country. Yeah. So um, that was a, a big draw for a lot of those students. And mm-hmm. then when you start having a bit of success out there, uh, you're going to certainly keep going back to the well. And uh, yeah. when I was there, we had a lot of very talented guys from the West Coast that were able to come in and do really well for us at Vassar and have a good athletic and academic experience yeah. there. Okay. Um, hey, and, and then now you're almost 10 years at, at like combing, like how long, how long did did it take for you to, to at like combing for you to be like, you know what, this is a program that I've built or created or to my standards and liking. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I got here in 2013, uh, you know, I was really searching for, um, you know, a school that was kind of similar to, again, what I was familiar with at Juniata and Susquehanna. I really loved uh, my experience there. and wanted to get back to a similar type school, uh, re- recruit similar type student athletes, uh, people who were looking for, what I felt probably a similar experience to what I was. Um, so I, I came in, it was my first head coaching job. I, you know, had no idea what to really expect other than, um, you know, trying to, to put my own stamp on a, a team and a program and build it and, and, and grow it. So um, when I first got here, I was hired in March of 2013. Uh, we only had 20 or only had 13 guys uh, on the roster. And uh, at that time, there were only two committed guys for the incoming class in March. So basically, it was March, and I was looking at a, a roster of 15 guys for the fall season. Wow. So priority number one was really to get rolling with recruiting. Um, and fortunately for me, um, I had developed a lot of good relationships with some recruiters. I was at Lafayette that, you know, maybe weren't quite good enough or, or mm-hmm. something that wasn't such a good fit but had developed a relationship. And so it had a lot of leads that I was able to get with right away uh, to try and recruit some guys to, to like homing. So the recruiting piece was priority number one, um, mm-hmm. just ensured that we could have a full roster for that fall. Uh, mm-hmm. And 
do was, um, you know, changing the, the, the culture and the mindset of the guys. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was really lucky um, that the 13 guys that were here uh, were just great people. Um, mm -hmm. they, so I came in, obviously change is difficult for anyone. And, mm -hmm. um, so here comes this, this new coach and they've got to, you know, kind of embrace new ideas, new, uh, new tactics, that kind of stuff. And these guys were 100%, uh, bought in straight from the start. And so wow. that first group, um, while they weren't the most, technical and they would be the first to admit they weren't the best soccer players um they just bought into to everything that we wanted to do and that started with the culture and the mindset mm -hmm. and, and and the workman's like mentality and they bought right into that uh, you know we talked about you know the upcoming schedule and some of the teams that we were going to play uh, i mean that year we were opening with york who was a top 25 team masada obviously was in the um yeah. was what was on the schedule. And so we had some really good teams that we were going to play. And so I looked at the guys and I said, you know, we're going to play some teams this year um, that we're going to be better than we're going to play some teams this year that we're probably not going to be as talented as, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no reason that we can't be the hardest working, uh, the fittest, the most organized, mm -hmm. you know, the best defensive team in any of these games. And I think if you said that, to a lot of college age or high school age players right now, uh, you'd probably get some backlash from that. No, oh, coach doesn't think we're that good. You know, we're going to play these teams that are better than us. And, you know, these guys just embraced it. They were like, mm -hmm. what coach says, and this is what he wants from us, and we're going to do these things. And mm -hmm. uh, we, I mean, I would say there probably weren't too many games where we got outworked, our teams were fitter than us or more organized. Yeah. Were, uh, and even though we weren't quite as talented, you know, we had some had some good players. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we snuck into the playoff that first year uh, as, the, as the four seed. Uh, and uh, on a crazy game, uh, you know, won the four five game and uh, won us a trip down to Messiah, who was the number one team in the country. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly had a lot of luck go our way that day. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the shots were, but uh, they were a lot to a little. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but our guys battled and they hung on and they were on point with everything that I asked them to do. Uh, we got it to PKs and uh, somehow snuck through. So, oh yeah, it was uh, <laughs> just a, a crazy game, a crazy experience. Uh, I give our guys all the credit in the world. Uh, for, for everything they accomplished. Uh, and then it was almost kind of a, a repeat uh, as exciting as that was. Uh, you know, we had to try and do it again three games later or three days. Uh -huh. later. Three days later. At, yeah. uh, at Elizabethtown in the conference wow. final. Uh, and so we had heard uh, a, a story, and I don't know if it was true or not, that uh, Elizabethtown had won their semifinal game in regulation. And so that game was over earlier. Yeah. And so their, their team and players uh, sat on the field and watched uh, the remaining minutes, uh, the overtime in the PKs of our game. Yeah. Of course, the E-Town players were rooting for Lycoming so they wouldn't have to play the number one team in the country. And, right, and right. So we had heard that and added a little bit of motivation to, to our guys as we prepared for, uh, you know, the, the conference final. Not that you need any – added motivation to play in the conference final, but that's, yeah. you know, added a little bit for our guys and they went down and did it again. Uh, we ended up in a zero, zero tie and, uh, uh, one in PKs and, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. So, um, <laughs> how do you so repeat was, that, uh, man? Yeah, <laughs> that's like uh, a storybook. <laughs> uh, as crazy as that was, I don't think that that's ever going to get repeated. <laughs> uh, as much as we would would love for that to be the case, but yeah. that was kind of the start that allowed us to be uh, allowed us to start to recruit higher level players. Yeah, and our kind of re recruiting mentality, you know, at that point was, you know, we won with this group of guys who were good players, but maybe not great players, uh, uh, but kind of bought into this mentality and yeah. this mindset. That 
We're not going to get outworked. We're not going to give up a goal to anybody. Uh, we're always going to be organized disciplined in everything that we do and guys that we recruited had to have that mindset mm-hmm. uh, but we're a, a little bit further along technically tactically and that really helped us bring in kind of that next level player which yeah. helped us make a big jump and uh kind of attributed to you know the success that we then were able to have in the in the years moving forward yeah I think that's a key, right? Like you have a successful year, it gives you a boost in the recruiting world, right? Like it just sort of opens Absolutely. up opens up another level of type of players that you could bring in. And the only Absolutely. way to recruit is, as far as I'm concerned, is you're either guaranteeing them to play or you have a good enough team where they want to be a part of it, right? Like those are the two options. And Absolutely. So, yep. Yeah, those are the... I mean, in our eyes, you know, the biggest decision that the players are making in terms of Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, yeah. in terms of you know more successful programs or building programs, you know, do mm-hmm. I want to go somewhere? I'm going to be the man, or I'm yeah. going to be uh, you know an important piece of the puzzle, or do I want to go somewhere where I might not get to play right away, but I feel like long term, you know, if I put in the work and do the right things, that yeah. you know, I'm be that important piece on maybe a more successful team and and things like that so and we talked to all of our recruits about you know the different things that you that you should be looking for in, in in the process i mean there's so many factors that go into you know the recruiting process and ultimately right. find uh, the right school and mm-hmm. it's probably a little crazy to say but you know today's world so many people get caught up in probably the wrong things yeah. what vision they are um, how, you know, how cool committing to this school is going to look to the friends or to yeah. the parents first, yeah. you know, ultimately what's going to be the best fit? Where am I going to get the best college experience yeah. academically, soccer wise? Yeah. Uh, and what everyone wants is a little bit different. Yeah. You know, what I want in a college experience is probably a little bit different than something that, that you want versus the yeah. next guy. And it's all about finding the, you know, the right fit that's going to provide you with the best experience yeah. for four years. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like, I, I think there's, and I just watch it with my my guys, right? Like, it's, there's so, there's so many non-important factors that influence them in their decision process. And I always have to ground them again. It's like, you, you are you, you really want to do that? Do you really want to think of that school as opposed to that yeah. school? You know, like, you got to, right. this is about you. It's not about guy next door or where he went or what it has nothing to do. It's like, this is about you in the next four years. And yep. So. yep. So many people get caught up about what's, what's cool for the next yep. you know, two weeks and yep. uh, the, what looks cool on social media and what they can tell their friends. Yeah. Uh, first, you know, once you're actually there living it for yeah. four years, yeah. uh, you know, how many of those people actually made a good decision are going to be there, you know, for four years. And at the end of the day, have set themselves up for the next steps. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced. And I, I think there's a lot to be said about the COVID stuff, but I'm convinced that a lot of the D one transfers that you see are, are those guys who in their head, they're like, I got to do D one yep. and then land D one and realize how not what it's not what they wanted and so as a result they're like i'm out of here i'm gonna go find a school where i can play or i can right. whatever those factors might be right and i just uh, right yeah i saw and i don't know how factual this is but i saw a tweet uh a couple of weeks ago that said uh there were x amount of players uh division one division two in the transfer portal mm-hmm. uh, and there are this many Division One and two college soccer athletes, and it came out that there were 19 percent of college players mm-hmm. uh, this past year at Division One, Division Two, are in the transfer portal. Yeah, wow. I just think that's crazy, and it doesn't include, you know, players that um, you know maybe yeah. got cut or cut. quit yeah. and are still are still staying at the same school, yeah. but are, are no longer on the team. And so when you look at players who pick these schools uh to go play you know, you're probably looking at 25 30 percent of every division one or division yeah. two player wow. yeah they've been getting through a second or third year on the uh, on the college yeah. soccer team. 
and it's because they don't prioritize the fig yeah. as opposed to, you know, so many of the other factors. Yeah. That go in. yeah. I, I just astonished. I always say like in a strange sort of way and sort of my son's experience, my oldest son's experience, like I say some of the best soccer players that would be gr great collegiate soccer players and that were great club ball players and high school ball players aren't playing the game anymore for, yeah. for those reasons, right? For, Hey, I'm going to go here. It doesn't pan, whatever the rationale is. And, and so you have a, you have a, a large number of players who are damn good soccer players who just aren't because they got whatever, you know, milled up in the process. Yep. Absolutely. You see it uh, more often now than, than ever before. And yeah. I think COVID certainly plays a part in that as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, you know, the NCAA is added to the fifth year yeah. of eligible work yeah. now yeah. Is, um, made it even more difficult that yeah. you see really talented high school and club players that say, Hey, yeah. you know, I the looks that I wanted, I'm just going to go to a school and, and not play. Yeah. It's really yeah. sad that, so many talented people out there that, you know, that are giving it up. My my son had two opportunities to play Division One, and everything seemed to be going okay. We we're going to trying to figure out this through COVID, and then um, um, coach at some point called coaches at some point called them up and said, "Hey, look, I got three super seniors the guys who got took the eligibility that are have decided right. to stay so i have no roster spots for you yep, so, absolutely and it was just kind of like we were it just stopped everything was like oh, we don't know what to do now and so anyhow yep. you know. that fifth year of eligibility is going to affect the recruiting process at colleges mm -hmm. until until that's done for the next few years few so years yeah because yeah. yeah. even the freshmen who became sophomores have that in their back yeah. pocket right like right right so um, I mean, I know I would like the way I was when I was in college. If somebody gave me an extra year of eligibility, I wasn't leaving. Like, oh, I was, I'm, you know, I'm with you. <laughs> I'd be no like, one. yeah, what, I'll get a second degree or something, yeah. you know, like I was just, yeah. So, um, Hey, I'm, I'm curious about this and, and, um, because everyone talks about it and I never really explored it. Um, do you have, yeah, I know you have team captains. Do you have like a leadership group on your for your squad, like a mix of other players besides captains? Yeah, I mean we I mean we talk about that with our, our, our guys quite a bit. Um usually the guys that are you know doing well at the next level are typically guys that were, you know, captains on their high school teams, captains on their club mm -hmm. teams. Um uh, and so kind of have that uh, experience, but, um, at the end, I mean, all successful teams are going to have multiple leaders. Yeah. Uh, you're not gonna, you're not going to be a successful team relying on just one, two or three guys that are your, your so-called captains. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we ask all of our players to, to take on leadership roles and to kind of step out of their comfort zones a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, provide that, you mm -hmm. know, maybe, one day your your captain is having a, a, a rough day for, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, or we is the whole team gonna suffer that day because, you know, one guy's having a rough go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, whether that's playing wise, whether that's emotionally, uh, mentally, whatever it may be. Um, and so you need guys uh, to be able to pick each other up and uh, you know, leaders of, of, of all ages, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly the incoming guys, your freshman group is going to need some time to, to adjust and get used to the college game and what it's all about. Uh, and, and that's another thing that, uh, when you have a good group of, of, of leaders, um, it makes that process so much easier. And I think that, um, our guys here over the past couple of years have done a really good job of this, that, um, you know, they, they know what the expectations are. And so the incoming guys come in. And they see what the upperclassmen, they see what the le uh, the leaders are doing, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Well, if they're doing this, and I guess this is what it, this is what it takes. This is what I need to do." Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, we talk to our guys a lot about you know when you get to college, you know, there's a lot of decisions about a lot of different things you can be doing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with your time, and doing the the cool thing uh, isn't always the the right thing. Yeah. And so when you've got uh, upperclassmen 
who basically, I mean, the coach is always going to say, you know, you, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've yeah, got to yeah. do this. Certainly, you know, guys are going to respect that and guys are going to listen to that to a degree, but there's always going to be that point where um, you're off the field, you have decisions to make and, you know, what are you going to do with those decisions? And when you've got a really good group of leaders and again, that's not just your captains, but it's your upperclassmen that are saying, you know, this is what we do in this situation. This how we act. This is what we do on the weekends. Um, this is what we do uh, during video sessions. You know, all, all of that kind of. This is what we do to, you know, we get an off day. We to, to get our extra reps in. You know, different things like that. Yeah. Your incoming guys, you know, see that and whoa, if this is what the upperclassmen are doing, then, you know, I need to buy into this. And it goes back to something that you said earlier, you know, when you do those things and then you see the success happen on the field, it, it, it makes you want to do that more yeah. where it can be really difficult um, when you're saying, you know, work harder, do more, do this, do that. And then you still go out 500 yeah. or you still go out and you don't necessarily see the results on the field. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it difficult. Fortunately for us, we've been able to have some pretty good, uh, some pretty good seasons, you know, to, to earn some wins and, and playoff opportunities and things like that. And so it kind of reemphasizes, hey, when you do the right things, you're going to you're going to get these types of, of, of opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're in a, as much success as we've had in maybe some of our past years, we're, you know, we're kind of up against it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, we had a rough go this fall right. uh, was a, the first time that we had, um, you know, less than a 500 record first mm -hmm. time we had made playoffs in a, in a long time. And so mm -hmm. uh, something you said earlier, you know, it's, you know, it had an impact on recruiting. Yeah. Uh, we had to dig a little bit deeper. Um, every recruit, you know, looks at records, looks at, yeah. hopefully they look at, you know, history and tradition as yeah, well. Yeah, and yeah. I think that, that may have helped us some, but you know, our, our season this year has made it difficult mm -hmm. uh, recruiting, but even more so than that, um, kind of changing the culture again um, from from some of the things that made us, you know, successful in the past, we probably got away from this fall. Mm -hmm. COVID certainly had an impact on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, so we're kind of trying to refine ourselves a little bit mm -hmm. after this past season, learning how – how to win close games, tight games. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, I thought this season, you know, we didn't lose games for a lack of talent. Yeah. Uh, I th um, it's kind of the opposite of, of 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, we were probably in most of the games we lost. I'm not going to say all of them. There were certainly some teams that we played this year that were better than us, but we played a lot this year that we were, and maybe I'm biased because I'm the coach, but I thought we were the more talented team. Mm -hmm. But, for, for whatever reason, yeah. uh, we just weren't able to do what was necessary to win some some tight games. And so we've got to kind of get back to the drawing board, um, figure out why you know we weren't able to get things done uh, in, in those games and for the, uh, in total for this season, yeah. and, and, and figure out how to get back to that winning mindset uh, and, and on that winning track. Was that, let me ask. I'm jumping ahead, but was that was this season the result of you mentioned sort of getting away from some of the core things that you would that you followed when you were successful in past years? Was it about getting away from theirs, or was there, was there something going on this fall that you thought was different, unique? That just again, I, I'm looking at your schedule. Yeah, to like I think all but a couple games. I, I think. I'm, I keep thinking Gettysburg and maybe Messiah where, where, all right, it just, the score just doesn't look right. Right. But everything else just looked like you were a shot away, a goal away. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it just sort of looked that way. And I did read some of the recaps. So was there something that was happening with the team or, or was it really about, well, we got away from our belief that we should defend, like defend, you know, yeah. I, I, I mean, don't know, I'm making it up, but yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. But I mean, we weren't as good defensively. We gave up more goals this year than uh, probably we've ever been. Uh, but at the same time, I probably wouldn't say we got away from, 
you know, those core principles. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it was a lack of, of effort by, by any stretch mm -hmm. or lack of defending from, uh, from our guys. I mean, we had three zero zero ties. This yeah. Year. That's, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and so we still in a lot of games did what we needed to do defensively. Um, and just, you know, struggled to, to generate a lot going forward. Mm -hmm. And we probably lacked just a, a little bit of quality in the attacking third. Um, and it wasn't just from our attacking players, but from our entire team. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been a team that scored a lot of set piece goals in the past, and we scored very few this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, you know, been a team that's been able to rely on uh, multiple players in the past mm -hmm. uh, to step mm -hmm. up and score big goals and big moments. And uh, I, I didn't think we had those clutch guys this year that were ready to step up yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and score in those moments. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's almost so like the, the perfect point. storm, right? But like the perfect storm of all these things coming together at the same time, right? Like not good on set pieces. Defensively, we were weak. Nobody was yeah. no, we had no go-to guy for goals, right? Like, and, and it all hits yeah. at once, right? Which is the worst case, but. but. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. And uh, with all that, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you, we can sit here and make those excuses, yeah. but we just didn't make the plays that we needed to. Yeah. And I think uh, guys were working, guys were in the right spots to make the plays a lot of the time and just for whatever reasons just didn't yeah. uh, take find a way to do it. Yeah. So I hope that's the case. I mean, certainly we're going to, you know, tweak some things for, you know, moving forward and correct things, but uh, hope to, to bounce back in a big way, mm -hmm. you know, here in a few months. So yeah. um, the guys are certainly hungry and motivated. Yeah. Um, they feel as badly as any of us about how this past year finished. And, yeah. you know, anytime that that happens, you know, you kind of, one of two things you accept it and just, you know, kind of soup to that level and like, this is who we are and this is where it's going to be. Or you're like, this isn't us. This isn't okay. Yeah. And we're going to make damn sure that this never happens, happens again. again. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, fortunately so far uh, throughout the winter and the spring, you know, I've seen the latter uh, from, from, from this group of guys. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, I mean, a, a, a difficult thing about for all of us uh, being fall sport athletes is so much of, I think, what these guys do over the next four months when we've got no impact, no control, yeah. has a huge impact on uh, how the fall okay. season's going to go. Yep. I mean, what, what guys are doing in June, July, and early August to get themselves ready is going to have a massive impact yeah. on how the early part of our season goes. Yep. I mean, three preseasons are seven to ten days. Yeah. You can't get somebody fit in that time. You can't get somebody technically down where he can yeah. finish at the level that you need yeah, him to yeah. finish in 10 days. Yeah. Uh, so getting 30, 35 guys on the same page, you know, all of that work needs to be done over the summer. Yeah. And basically your 10 days is to, to tactically get them on the same page. page. Yeah. You know, that, and if they come in and they're not fit, and if they're not playing at a high level in terms of te their technical passing yeah. and finishing, we're just not going to be ready to go yeah, by yeah. the time the first game rolls around. It, it, it is true, the importance of the off months, right? Like, yeah. the, especially leading up to the fall, um, just because there is no, like you said, there is no time to do all of the things you would need to do to get you to a spot where you can be better right like you can't you can't i don't want to say waste because it's never a waste but you can't waste your time on working on tech technical aspects of the players because they haven't touched a ball in three months <laughs> you know right. like, you know, like right. we can't even do some basic drills and we have to go back yeah. to fundamentals of okay this is how you trap a ball <laughs> you know and yeah. you can't yeah. can't afford to do that absolutely hey let let me ask you, you mentioned it a couple of times. I'm just curious, like, how was that COVID period for you guys? Like, how did you weather it? Was it difficult? Was it easy? Was it fun? Was it terrible? Um, I don't think anybody had a tremendous amount of fun, but I'm, I figured I would ask. Yeah, 
fun absolutely would be the last thing that I would, uh, <laughs> yeah. describe our experience with uh you know the COVID. yeah um, yeah i mean for for everyone it was difficult and uh as as you say that i mean it, it instantly you know makes me think of um just a few months ago at our at our uh our team banquet uh mm-hmm. at the end of the year uh, we ask each of our seniors just to get up and you know talk for a minute or so yeah. about their experience um you know, here at the school, what it was like being involved in the program and the things like that. And one of our seniors steps up and the very first thing that he says is, you know, we've been here for eight semesters, four years, five of those semesters we've spent dealing with COVID. Yeah. You know, how do you, you go to a college for four years, yeah. and you expect all of these things yeah. and during their time, they get three semesters yeah. of what you would say normal. normal. Yeah. All wow. Life is like and so you just feel for those seniors or mm-hmm. well, for everyone but you know to, to say i went to college and for five of my semesters you know i was constantly getting tested yeah. i was constantly wearing a mask i you know i couldn't do this i couldn't do that and it's just like right. no one have to go to college and not be you know be, be their experience yeah. so you know fortunately for us here at like homing um you know that when the first uh, when COVID first broke out, you know, we sent everyone home for, for spring break mm-hmm. and then you know, uh, decided to, to finish the, the semester remotely. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, we were very fortunate that we were able to have our students and our athletes on campus yeah. and in person uh, for every, you know, semester moving forward from mm-hmm. there. So that was a good thing. Like Homing did a really good job of ensuring our students could be on campus mm-hmm. and, um, you know, missing the fall season had a had a massive impact. Mm-hmm. You know, got so go get so excited. I mean, and we asked so much of these guys in terms of their, you know, training full full year round. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and that's you know from your strength training to your fitness to your technical work to you know playing pickup or in, in summer leagues, and you get so excited and you work so hard for for 365 days, and then you get to school here in August or September, and they're like. Uh, yep, no games. No games. And no. so it was just, uh, it, it was really, you know, deflating in that yeah. sense. Um, fortunately, again, I mean, we were able to continue to train uh, mm-hmm. with some restrictions and limitations on the number and whether it was with mask and, and some of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, you go, I mean, part of the college experience and why you're choosing schools is, you know, not the decision, but part of it is a place where you can go play. Yeah. And then, you know, one of your seasons, you only get four of them, you know, they're telling you, you don't get to play. And so yeah. I think that that took a lot out of, um, you know, our group. I think they did handle it as, as best they could. They realized there was nothing the day or anyone else could do about it. Yeah. And, you know, all you can do is make the most of every opportunity that you get to, mm-hmm. to, to try. Mm-hmm. And um, the ones that I felt, you know, absolutely the worst four were uh, not this year's seniors, but last year's seniors. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about the COVID year and, and some of the opportunities that some of these students are, are still continuing to get. Uh, here at Lycoming, uh, we don't have any uh, graduate degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so mm-hmm. the only reason that you get to come back or would come back for a, you know, a fifth year to use your senior year of eligibility uh, is if you're going to pursue a second degree. Yeah. Uh, second major, an additional minor, uh, you know, something like that. And um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of money to consider, you know, if it's really a degree that you're doing just for soccer, you know, you know, so many of them have opportunities to make money right out of school, you know, here I spend another X amount of dollars Mm -hmm. getting a major that maybe I really don't want Mm -hmm. uh, when I can go in get this job and start making some money right now. Mm-hmm. You know, most guys uh, have a good head on their shoulders yeah. and are like, you know, I've done my college experience. You know, I've had a, had a great time. I'm going to miss out on it a, a year and that really sucks. But, um, you know, it's time to turn the page and, yeah. and, and move on where so many schools now, and I would say most offer some type of graduate right. program yeah. or five-year degrees or six-year degrees yeah. in, in certain areas um, 
you know, and, uh, even within our conference in the in, in the Mac Freedom, so many of our competitors, you know, you see the students coming back for yeah. for fifth year as and, graduate students, or yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, a perfect example of this. I mean, we went to play at Stevens this year, uh, who's a very good side. Soccer, yeah. And, and, and it was their senior day, um, the last game of the regular season. And we were both in a position where um, if they won, they got into the playoffs. If we won, we got into the playoffs. So it was kind of a playing game for mm-hmm. both of us um, to, to make our conference playoffs. And uh, it was their senior day. They were honoring 20 seniors on that day. Oh um, they had 13 seniors and seven fifth years. Oh my gosh. Uh, um, and, and some of those guys, I mean, one was uh, a, ge- a goalkeeper who was on the roster at UCLA for four years. Oh my uh, gosh. One of them was yeah. uh, an outside back who started at Lehigh yeah. uh, for two years and was a starting outside back for, for them. Yeah. And so, um, and there we were. I mean, we had seven seniors on the roster, but through injuries yeah. and COVID and a few other things, we were starting – three seniors on that day. Yeah. Uh, here we are trying to, to win our biggest game of the season to make the playoff against a team that's honoring 20 seniors. Yeah. And some of that based on the opportunities for them to have, you know, fifth years and graduate. I mean, Stevens has an outstanding engineering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're top program. One of the top. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, students that are going to UCLA, Lehigh, uh, I think they had another one that was either Northeastern or BU. Yeah want the graduate degree in engineering from Stevens that are going there and then, you know, are able to play an extra year. Yeah. So uh, it, it's great for, you know, the opportunities they get at Stevens and kind of an uphill challenge for us, yeah. um, you know, right now, but they're not the only ones. I mean, there's so many schools yeah. out there right yeah. now that offer that, that offer that fifth year due to the graduate degrees. And, um, but for us, I mean, you know, where some schools aren't maybe recruiting as many players because of that, because they have the re- returning fifth years. You know, we're bringing in, you know, full rosters every year because mm-hmm. our guys are graduating in four years and then, yeah. you know, moving on. And so we've got to replace those guys where, you know, some other schools maybe aren't, aren't necessarily bringing in as many with, that, with those classes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like for you, I would think business as usual from that standpoint, right? Just the recruiting, like I still need 10 guys or 12, whatever your numbers are, right? Like I still need those numbers. I can't afford not to, right? Like, like, again, Stevens or whoever, I mean, that the transfer portal might just be like their recruiting class if they wanted to, right? So. Yeah, right. They very well could be. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, you you mentioned that, I'm curious that the three, three ties that you had this year. Yeah. What do you have any thoughts on the, on the changes they made this year to the, to no overtime in regular season, no golden goal, uh, knowing that you had the three ties. Um, do you have any, you have any thoughts on that about not going to OT good, bad, yeah, and different? I, yeah, no, uh, I'm certainly not in support of, uh, of that rule change. Uh-huh. Um, nothing to do with our, um, three zero zero ties this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that's uh, part of the game. And I think some of the most exciting moments in so many people's careers have been, um, you know, that thrilling, you know, game winning goal. Yep. Uh, and yeah, you hate to be on the, the wrong side of that. Those are just crushing, you yeah. know, over time, golden goal defeats. But um, I, I certainly think that that, you know, adds some incentive for our guys to, to be fitter um, mm-hmm. for us, the importance of carrying uh, more quality players, deeper mm-hmm. roster. I think that uh, so many division three programs do have bigger rosters. You know, we're not just carrying the minimum 24 player roster, 26 mm-hmm. player roster. You look at a lot of division three programs across, across the country. A lot of them are upper twenties, low thirties, some are even mid thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because of that, I think a lot of player or a lot of programs have the ability to play more players. Mm-hmm. And they're with the NCAA substitution rules, you know, you have the ability to to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, again, it's just some of the most exciting moments uh, in my playing career, in my coaching career. Uh, I could think back and, and remember those, you know, awesome 
you know, uh, yeah. uh, golden goal finishes and, yeah. and, and overtime. Um, I'm more neutral on the playoff overtime. Yeah. Uh, where you play two full overtimes and it's not golden, golden goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with that change. Yeah. Uh, Certainly against uh, the elimination of overtimes in in, in the regu- regular season, uh, I just think that's such a fun time. Yeah. Uh, such a such a gut check. Such a, a you know a really cool thing to experience. Mm-hmm. You know some of those golden goals and you know just you know some of the character building that you talk about with your uh, your student athletes all the time. You know. Yeah getting put in really difficult situations and how do you respond or how do you act and uh, building that, you know, team camaraderie, you know, through being in those difficult situations, Mm -hmm. I I think is a really cool thing. And uh, I know for us, we'll, we'll miss the overtime. And I, you know, certainly not, not happy with that one in terms of, uh, of that Mm -hmm. change. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I've kind of, I'm kind of tossed on that one, you know, like it's literally like, yeah, I could see why there wouldn't, you, we wouldn't want to do the OT during the season. Oh, but uh, you know, I could see why you'd want to keep the OT. <laughs> you know, I can't. And and I think it's just because of where I sit, right? Like I don't, I don't have a skin in that oh, I, game. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get, I mean, the main reason why people want to do it. I mean, jamming 18 to 20 games. games yeah. 20, 20 or in a 10 week period. Yeah. It, it's just a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so then you go and you add, you know, an additional 10 or 20 going to those games on top of it. Yeah. You know, you do run the risk of injury a little bit more, you know, it affects yeah. travel and return time yeah. and, and things like that. So I, I get why people are in support of eliminating the overtime. Mm-hmm. Just me personally, I think that, you know, what you can gain from those experience, I think outweighs a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. you know, the, you know, eliminating it altogether. Um, do you think that's going to change the way you coach a game d- during the regular season now that you know there's no OT? Or do you think other coaches are going to have to think differently or play differently? I, I mean, I certainly don't, don't want to speak to any other coaches. I mean, I'm sure it'll change for some. I'm sure some will carry on uh, a- as usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Weaker teams maybe are in support of this because it makes it a little bit easier to maybe gain a draw against a, yeah, a better yeah. team, um, different things like that. You know, f- for us, we're not playing any game to, to tie. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going out to to play and play well and, and, and do what it takes to, to win. Certainly where I think for us, you, you potentially see some changes. is just the, you know, the last 20 minutes of it. You know, if there's 20 minutes to go in a game yeah. and, you know, it's a tie game. There's a big difference between knowing, yeah, you've only got 20 minutes to decide this game first. You know, if you're thinking, I've got two overtimes, yeah. we still got 40 minutes. Yeah. You know, that's where potentially, um, you know, there may be some changes. You know, maybe, you know, you rest some of your better attacking players more in the second half thinking, you know, you're still going to have them for the overtime. Mm-hmm. Where now is if there's, you know, you're not getting overtime, you've got to maybe keep your top – top guys out there a little bit longer, even if they are dragging a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think the biggest change is, I, I think for us, you'll see just in the last 20 minutes, knowing that, hey, we've only got 20 minutes to decide this as opposed to potentially maybe maybe mm-hmm. 40 minutes. Okay. Um, do you have any non-negotiables for your team? Like if I'm, if, you know, after our conversation, you tell me, Paul, I really want you to join, even at your young age of 53, to join like Um, come on board. Uh, would there be things that I would have to be willing to commit to, to be part of that I, to program? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one, one, the overall experience. Um, You've got to be committed to, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, your academics. You know, we're not carrying anyone along with a a 1.2 GPA. Uh, We're not carrying along guys who are just trying to skate by to Mm -hmm. to stay eligible. 
people. We're not carrying guys along that uh, think it's okay to to skip class on Fridays just because they don't they don't feel like going. Um, your academic experience has to be your number one priority, and um, I, I think that that's one of the big benefits of coming to a smaller school um, like Lycoming is that everything's a little bit more personalized. Um, you know, there's certainly this doesn't make our school better academically. It doesn't make our school worse academically. When you're talking about a, a you know a college with you know twelve or thirteen hundred students, for some of these larger universities with ten twenty thousand students. Mm-hmm. Just your, your classroom experience is going to be different. Mm-hmm. You're sitting in a class with 15 students versus sitting in a freshman seminar with 200. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of our professors are, you know, taking attendance uh, and may, some of them are even grading on class participation and, mm-hmm. and different things like that so that they are engaged. Whereas at some of these huge universities, yeah. if you got 100, 200 students in a class, the professor has no if you're there they have no idea if you're participating or not um and so that's one of the things that kind of we pride ourselves on here is that type of interaction with professors other classmates in terms of your your academic experience and so guys that come here have to kind of embrace that Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that you're going to get that experience by coming to a smaller school and then you have to to buy into that going to class and then just sitting there you know it's not gonna not gonna fly here Mm -hmm. Uh, just deciding that you don't want to go to class on Friday, uh, that that's not going to fly here. And Mm -hmm. again, I've I've been here nine years now going on to 10. So I feel like uh, I know just about all of the professors. I've got a pretty good relationship with them. They know where I stand on the the academic piece uh, and, and, uh, and full support of them in terms of their uh, participation policy, attendance policies, Mm -hmm. uh, homework policies, all of that kind of stuff. And so we're at so many schools, if player X, you know, doesn't show up for a class and then bombs, you know, the first exam at so many schools, like the coach has no idea. No idea. You know, what, yeah. what player wants to go to the coach and be like, Hey coach. Uh, yeah. I've skipped class twice in the last week and I just got a 42% on my yeah. last exam. Yeah. And yeah, nobody will do that. And, and so here, you know, I'll hear from a professor, Hey, I know, you know, Bobby's on the soccer team. He missed a class and he really struggled with his first exam. You know, any idea what's going on there? You know, and it really allows me to, you know, to reach out to those guys and connect with them and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, this isn't going to fly. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to continue to play on this team, you know, this isn't this isn't going to be okay. And so yeah. I think uh, while that may talk for some of those guys who want to sleep in on a day or maybe aren't as motivated to get the 3.0 or or better you know i think you know that they learn pretty quickly that that's that's going to be an important part of the process for them mm-hmm. you know if they want to stay here yeah. so so that's the academic piece um just from a cultural piece uh, you know no one individuals you know bigger than the program yeah. you know we will survive minus any one person, this program would survive minus, you know, including myself. I think that the program's at a point now where um, it's not just going to run on its own, but it's pretty self-sufficient. Yeah. And that's just based on the core group of guys here they bought into. And so, uh, as I said before, uh, a lot of incoming guys kind of see what the expectations are from the mm-hmm. upper class. And they've got to make a decision pretty early on. Like, uh, am I going to buy into this yeah. or am I going to try and do my own thing yeah. and guys do their own thing or be the cool guy? Um, you know, that doesn't, doesn't always fly here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, it's interesting. Cause you didn't, it's, it, they're not, that's not soccer. I don't want to say that's not soccer it translates into soccer, right? And it, your discipline outside of soccer translates into your, oh, coach, you still there? Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. All right, good, good. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, um, but you're, that was all, like this is your college experience. These are the rules that we expect. If you're going to be a part of the team, these are the rules of your college experience. 
And then, like it's, like I said, it just sort of translate will translate into the soccer for you. I, I think that's pretty. Absolutely, and I, I that's pretty cool. I talk about this with our guys all the time. Very rarely will you see a committed soccer player who is not committed to their academics. You know, most mm-hmm. of the successful people are the ones who they figure out what it takes to be good, and that's not just in soccer, mm-hmm. but that's more so. Uh, in life, in academics, and, and yeah. things like that. Hey, if the professor is requiring me to do this, then I'm going to find a way to get this done. If the soccer coach is requiring me to do this, then I'm going to figure mm-hmm. out a way to, to get it done. And it's not not very often you see yeah. somebody that's out there killing it, working their tail off on the soccer field, that's then just like, oh, yeah, I don't give a crap academically, and I'm going to be okay with this 1.2 GPA. You know, they yeah. a lot of times they go go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's no splitting of the two, right? Like there's no compartmentalizing. <laughs> like if you're a goofball academically, you're probably a goofball Ab- athletically. Absolutely. Like yeah. I think and, I'm, and you're always gonna have a, a different range. You're gonna have your students who are academically right. you know, fourteen, fifteen hundred on their SATs, and then you may have others that are yep you know, 10 or 1100 on their SATs, you know, those are obviously going to be different, but the amount of effort and the time that you put forth to, to maximizing your, your performance academically is what we're most concerned about. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we talked a little bit about the season and all, and I was just curious when you, you know, how intentional are you about, about, um, about when you, when you create your schedule, finding tough opponents to play against. Absolutely. And, and I, I know some of it's, for, some of it's the conference, I get it, but you know, you, you play Messiah, you play Stevens, you play Haverford, you play Gettysburg. These are, you know, these are quality teams, programs that even, even if you were, you know, 15 0 and 1 would still be super challenging games, you know. <laughs> like, so uh, yeah, I'm just curious how intentional you are about that. Yeah, that's uh, so it's very important and it kind of it, it brings up a sore subject to, to me that I'll never forgive myself for. Um, so 13, you know, we discussed earlier about uh, you know, our run and winning the, the conference and getting to the end, mm-hmm. and at that point, I still wasn't exactly sure of you know, our, our overall level. I knew we were headed in the right direction. We had a great core group of guys that were doing right things. We had recruited a good group for 2014, but I still didn't know how good we were actually going to be. We Mm. got hot at the right time, great three week stretch. And, uh, you know, it was awesome, but I didn't know if we were a legit NCAA tournament team at that time. And so we went into 2014. I didn't tweak our schedule too much. And Mm -hmm. we ended up that year going 15, three and three um, Mm -hmm. with two of those losses being to Messiah, who was again, the number one team in the country. Number one. So if you take out playing the number one team in the country, we're 15, one and three and Mm -hmm. lost to Messiah in the conference final and Mm -hmm. didn't get an at large bid to the NCAA tournament. And Mm -hmm. because of my strength of scheduling. And that year I mm-hmm. didn't do a good enough job of putting our guys in a position. And we were good enough that year to be an NCAA tournament team, but didn't get to play in the NCAA tournament because of mm-hmm. my lack of scheduling. And so Next I, schedule, that yeah. was a young coach, naive coach mistake that mm-hmm. uh, I'll never forgive myself for, for that group of seniors. Fortunately, yeah. Um, for them, they got the NCAA tournament experience uh, the mm-hmm. year previously. So I didn't rob them completely of it. Um, but that year, if I would have done a better job scheduling, they would have had another opportunity to play in the tournament. Uh, but right. uh, you live and learn and uh, will not make that mistake again. Uh, in 2015, moving forward, every year we will play a schedule that um, will give our guys – two chances to get into the NCAA tournament. Uh, one, yeah. you know, you win your conference tournament and, and do it that way. But uh, two, if you should have a good enough year, um, the, you will have a good enough strength of schedule to get uh, an at-large bid. 
And it's just up to the players yeah. then to, you know, take care of business on the field and some of those big games. Yeah. But, you know, a, a majority of the guys that come here, they want to play in those games. They want to play with yeah. it against the best. Um, they want to play Messiah. They want to play Gettysburg. They want to play Rowan. Um, they want Rowan, yeah. You know, they fun. they want to play those types of teams, and uh, you know, you find out where you're at. You know, if you're good enough to be in the yeah. NCAA tournament, you don't have to win all of those games, but you got to win some of them. And if you're not going to be in the NCAA, uh, if you're not good enough to be in the NCAA tournament, then you're probably going to lose those games. And so yeah. it's just a great measuring stick for us to see where we're at, and we try and. Yeah space them out as best we can. You know, you play some of those teams early, you play some of them in the middle yeah. and you play some of them at the, at the end, you know, and that, cause yeah. you know, teams change throughout the season, you know, hopefully yeah. uh, like in 2013, you know, you're peaking at the right time. Um, but I know yeah. for us, uh, it, it, it wasn't just injury, but injuries crushed us this past year. And so what I would say, well, I'd love to say we were peaking at the end of the season, like we were supposed to, we definitely weren't peaking the last two weeks of the, the regular season this year. And now, and that was yeah. one of the reasons And we lost, you know, we lost big games at that time. Uh, and so we try and as much as a lot of the conference games are your games at the end of the season, those do matter the most. Those are the games that you want to win and win the conference, but um, you always want to throw in there um, some of the top teams and our guys love playing mm -hmm. Messiah. They really get up for that game. They love playing Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. You know, they love playing Swarthmore. They love playing Ryan, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and a number of others. I mean, we've got an awesome rivalry yeah. with Susquehanna uh, battle of the boot there. So that game is always uh, extremely fun for our guys to play. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, every year we're going to challenge our guys. We're going to play against some really good teams and, and look forward to, to seeing where our teams at that year at that time. I, I, again, telling my boys and like you, the, the choice between a easy win, right. Versus, you know, going up, being really challenged, like take the challenging game every time you can, because that's the only way you get yep. better. And it has, and it might not be the soccer that gets better, but it'll be like, Hey, I've been in this situation exactly. before. I know exactly what it's like to play against, yep. you know, I am not that lamb going to slaughter anymore, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to fight yep. back. I know, yep. right? And it, I think just for that, for that reason. Um, and there is a fine line, though. Um, you've got, you've, you've oh, got, sure. You've got yeah, to know yeah. your team. Um, you got to yeah. know what they're capable of doing. Um, mm -hmm. You've got a team that's not able to quite compete at that level. And then you go out and throw yeah. a schedule of those types of teams. And now you're getting yeah. beat 4 0 every game. You know, a, yeah. a person and a team can only take so much of that before, yeah. you know, it becomes yeah. it's old, you know, real quick. So you got to know your team. You got to know what kind yeah. of fighters they are. You got to know what kind of level they are uh, from a soccer mm -hmm. playing perspective. Uh, you got to know what kind of leadership that they, you know, handle those mm -hmm. types of situations. Uh, and again, we've been lucky that we've had, you know, a lot of those things in place here, which has given us the ability to play some of those mm -hmm. teams. And yeah, we don't always win them all, but we've done a pretty good job of being able to compete and be competitive in, in some of those big games. Yeah. 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 No, that, that conversely, you, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to have a schedule that all you're doing is getting pummeled because after a while there's no learning there, right? Yeah. right? There's no, there's no experience to be gained that or something that's not happened already. And that, that gets to be totally demotivating. Yeah. Um, what? So, so we're beyond COVID, you know, beyond COVID. Like what, what sort of expectations do you have for, for next year? Yeah. I mean, um, our expectations. I mean, next year, wait a second. Let me rephrase that. What expectations do you have for the, in two and a half months? <laughs> you know, was, like where did the time go? Holy it is smoke. crazy. It's coming, it's coming pretty yeah. quickly. So, um, <laughs> yeah, our, I mean, yeah, we're coming off a rough year. Um, as I said before, but, um, uh, very pleased with how our winter and spring season went. Um, 
obviously we're limited over the summer with our with our contact, but I'm confident that our guys are, are going to do the right things over the next few months. And uh, yeah, when you miss the playoffs and finish under 500, next year can't come soon enough. I mean, I wish we were, <laughs> I wish we were playing our opening game tomorrow and, and get that yeah. you know, that nasty taste out of your mouth. But uh, expectations will remain high. Uh, and, See that with the schedule that we're playing again for for next year, we're playing a, a really challenging schedule with a lot of good teams. Um, I think we've got a good balance. We're only going to have um, we're going to have a small group of seniors, but I think a very committed and, and, and good leadership group of seniors there, uh, and then a bigger group of juniors. Um, so mm. uh, we're not going to be senior heavy, but I think we're going to have a lot of upper class experience. and experience. Yeah. yeah. And so I talked about that, you know, the game that we played against Stevens this year at the end mm. of the year, you know, we're starting three seniors. So that means that we're playing yeah. with a lot of underclassmen that are gaining, mm. you know, valuable experience, you know, and yeah. we kind of took our lumps this year because of that, you know, we had to learn kind of mm. on the fly. Uh, we took our lumps, but I'm hoping that that's going to lead to, um, you know, a, a lot of good things here in the, in the next few months. So, Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we've got the core core group um, to to see a lot of good things in the fall. Uh, we did have to bring in a a, a big group of, of freshmen, um, and so getting them integrated uh, quickly will be very important because we will uh, be relying on some of these incoming freshmen to to have an impact mm-hmm. early on. So, kind of their progress and transition um, to the college game will be very important through preseason in the first couple of weeks, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll find out early. I mean, uh, we go Mm -hmm. on the road um, for our opening game uh, and then we get uh, Johns Hopkins, you know, right out of the gate. Then we do, uh, you know, Susquehanna and then uh, the following weekend we're doing uh, Haverford and Rowan. So, you know, our first five games right out of the gate, uh, are going to be a real challenge, but uh, I, I wouldn't do yeah. that if I didn't think that our guys would be ready to play uh, yeah. you know, right away. So uh, a lot of it's on them uh, to do their work over the summer and to, to come in and then, you know, on me and our staff to get the, the first year guys integrated and up to speed quickly. And we're certainly going to get tested, but, uh, you know, looking forward to, to sep- September 1st when we go to New York for, for Mount St. Mary's. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you jump right into the fire. There's no, <laughs> you're, you know, once you start. So, hey, um, you, I think it's 2023. You're moving to the Landmark Conference. Is That's that, correct. Is that yep. correct? Yeah. You have any thoughts on that? I mean, or is, you think it's going to be good for, for, for your program or? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of discussion about that over the past year. A lot of, a lot of positives about the move. Uh, a lot of things about mm-hmm. the change, some things that maybe not so excited about. Uh, it's going to be a, a very challenging uh, conference to play in. I mean, there's a lot mm-hmm. of teams that have had a ton of success uh, just in the last couple of years. Uh, when you think of Scranton's been to the Elite Eight, Drew's been to the yeah. Sweet 16, Catholic's been NCAA tournament the last couple of years. Susquehanna has been to the Sweet 16. I mean, everyone knows the history and tradition at, at Elizabethtown uh, yeah. and, and then a number of others. I mean, the Moravian just got a, you know, a Division One head coach uh, a couple right. of years ago, and they've, they've been on the rise. Uh, Juniata just got a new coach who has experienced a ton of success uh, at Swarthmore, and uh, their incoming class. I spoke to him. He's a good guy. Yeah. I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna do something special yep. there. Uh, Juniata is uh, absolutely on the rise uh, with that soccer program. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of really, really tough teams, and there will be no, mm-hmm. no easy games in the landmark. That's that's mm-hmm. for sure. Um, so again, but I mean, we're excited about that that challenge. Um, you know, of, of, of playing a really competitive, you know, conference schedule. Um, mm-hmm. we'll, probably impact our non-conference schedule a little bit. Um, but, uh, so yeah, we're, um, uh, we're excited about the move. I mean, one of the, I mean, I think one of the big reasons for it, I mean, just the schools in general are a lot more similar with a lot of 
pools mm-hmm. in the landmark. So in that sense, I think it's it's a good fit. You see um, where a lot of the schools in the MAC, both in the Commonwealth and the Freedom, you know, have the grad programs, uh, um, mm-hmm. have have more students, uh, things yeah. like that, where uh, Juniata, Elizabethtown, Drew, uh, Goucher, um, are all small private liberal arts schools, less than 2,000 yeah. students. Uh, and, yeah. you know, some of them have grad programs, but very few or don't offer an extensive amount of grad programs. And so I just when yeah. you think about overall similarities, I think Lycoming is much more similar to a lot of the landmark schools and kind of mm-hmm. what some of the MAC, both Commonwealth and Freedom schools have become. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. I just was scouring your website just uh, yesterday or last night, and I, I saw the release, and I thought, oh, yeah, that'll be good to ask. A um, couple more questions, and then I'll let you go down with your 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 day. Uh, it, do you use any of those recruiting websites? Not websites, companies, you know, um, like N- N- S- NCSA yeah. and any of those services or are you more of the traditionalists that you, you know, I'm, I'm going to go recruit. I'm doing it. My, I'm going to call, I'm going to go to showcase tournaments. Yeah, I would, I would say both. Um, Certainly the preferred method is to get out in front of uh, as many players as many times as possible and see them live. Uh, Mm -hmm. We will uh, certainly look at, any of those recruiting agency uh, player profiles and videos that come through, uh, mm-hmm. we will, you know, and maybe as a, as, as a good point of reference or starting point, look at the profile, look at the video and be like, yeah, that's somebody we need to find more about or that's somebody we mm-hmm. got to go out and see or, um, but yeah, we're not going to make a roster decision simply based on, yeah. Um, a recruiting profile or a recruiting video. All of the guys that come here, we're going to need to see play live at some point, whether that's at our ID camp, whether it's at someone else's ID camp, or whether it's a state cup game, a high school game, or, you know, a a club tournament that we're, that we're at. Mm -hmm. So um, Mm -hmm. however we find a way to get it done, you know, we uh, will, we'll find guys in all those different areas or methods. Um, But yeah, not, not going to make a roster spot simply over a, a recruiting video, but a lot, they can be yeah. certainly useful in, Hey, here's a guy we want to learn more about, get us in contact with them and find out where, when we can, can go see him play live and in person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of, do you, I assume you have your own ID camp and, and, and how important do you consider your ID camp versus something like a showcase where you would just go to, you know, to spend a day watching games and players. So we, due to COVID, we've had to put our uh, ID camp uh, on hold the last couple of years. So we actually haven't had uh, an ID camp in a few years now. That's something that obviously has become more and more popular. Um, Um, We did do that uh, a few years prior to COVID and uh, we'll mm -hmm. get that up and going again this summer for the first time in a few Mm -hmm. years. So uh, we're looking forward to starting that up again. Um, of course we love having, uh, love having as many people as possible, you know, get to that, but, uh, it's not one of those where you have to come to ID camp for us to consider you at like home. Um, you know, most of the guys that, you know, that we end up getting, uh, you know, we're seeing it, your typical showcases or high school games or playoff games and and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, a lot of times the ID showcase or ID camps are, you know, maybe a second, a third, a fourth time that we've seen them play, it gets them on campus, you know, some of those things. Yeah. What, um, do you, what showcases do you usually try to hit? I would assume it'd be localized, right? So PA, New Jersey, what you mentioned, Maryland. Yeah, for the most part, um, we're open to, to getting out and going, you know, anywhere. Um, we've, We've been to Disney. We've done some of those, um, but I wouldn't say that those are the ones that we're, you know, counting on or get to regularly. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time down as far as, you know, Jeff Cup in Richmond, um, you know, Potomac, Bethesda, you know, typical Mm. PDA, PA Classic. Yeah. uh, Some of the ones out in Pittsburgh, some of the ones 
uh, upstate yeah. New York. But yeah, typically most of them are within a, a four hour, four hour yeah. radius, you know, with the ones down in mm-hmm. Richmond, maybe being, you know, four and a half to five hours. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Look, I'll let you get on with your, your day. Um, really do appreciate you taking the time today. This was, this was, uh, this was awesome. This was, I really enjoyed our, uh, our conversation and hopefully we can connect before, um, uh, before the season and maybe do a, you know, quick 20 minute check in, get your feelings about the, you know, upcoming preseason and, and sort of if you have any different ideas and thoughts about, what you're about to embark on. Yeah. So well, no, I really um, appreciate you having me really enjoyed this conversation and uh, yeah, I would love to, uh, to check in again here in a, in a few months.